not a huge amount of people at the moment, but um, we've got a couple of really keen uh, developers. Um, so um, when I after I graduate, I joined the IBM team um, to develop the IBM JDK to so the JDM. Um, there's still a couple of pieces of code that's actually still in production, so I'm um, glad I've got this year. Um, I'm now uh, working in the investment bank, um, looking after the infrastructure, Java infrastructure. That shall not be named, but you probably still discover who they are when you talk because uh, my uh, place that I work, they say, well, we should uh, shouldn't associate what you do in the daytime with the Java user group, so I tend to not to mention their name, but you will get to men get get their message when they talk every day so you will discover why a bit. Okay. Um, so a little bit more about Hong Kong Java user group. Um, we were founded in 2000, and uh, we are basically uh, sort of like a group of developers that are trying to sort of like get together and talk about share and with their experience on Java and Java languages as well. Because obviously now um, these days things like Ruby and stuff like that on JVM is much better than uh, the, the other. Uh, the, um, so, so far we do organize talks and uh, events and, and things like that, so um, please feel free to go to the website, www.page.org, or go to Facebook. There's probably more active on Facebook um, than the website, so please take a look. Um, come and join us. So uh, we will have our next meeting on Thursday. We, I'm going to do a more extended talk on Java 8. We can also have uh, somebody come and talk to us about the uh, uh, the Apache's um, Java OpenStack um, API later on in, um, in, in November. So please feel free to come and come to our meeting. You can find those information on our website. Right, so um, obviously I've only got about half an hour, so, and, uh, <laughs> so like, you know, there's a lot of stuff to talk about. Um, so I'm not going to be uh, really in depth into. Uh, into what's new in Java 8 that comes still through why so for some of these being implemented and what's in that. Um, and if you really want to find out more, you should come to the first day's meeting and we're going to take a look at a deeper look in terms of what's going on there. But uh, I'm going to uh, talk about lambdas, why it's sort of called the closures for Java, why, why is it there. Uh, I'm not going to talk about defender methods, because consider that most of you are um, probably not Java developers and you probably uh, find that a bit sort of like crazy because it's probably a bit difficult. Um, I'm going to talk about class library update, Nashcon. So, anybody heard of Nashcon? No? Okay. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about a bit of plus spot JVM changes. Okay. Um, and finally, I'll probably take five minutes in terms of talking about what's going on in, in terms of the uh, open JDK, open source um, JVM side and how can we uh, help. Right, so just some statistics for Java 8. Um, so since um, so far, you know, JDM, the, the Java, uh, the whole Java stack has been open source by Oracle, um, they implement some sort of, um, in, yeah, in Python community, you have probably heard of a Python enhancement request, so that, that, that PR, uh, or something like that. So the Java community, in terms of the JDK community, they also model that. And so they have something um, called the um, Java Enhancement Proposal in the class. So there's 55 of them, so that, um, that sort of introduced features that in the um, open JDK. Um, that's sort of like pretty interesting. And so they've got 55 of them, 6 million of lines in the JDM, so it's quite a complex piece of software. Um, we've got 100 active contributors, not just from Oracle, but from people like IBM, Azure, SAP. Red Hat, Google, so a lot of companies actually um, work together to sometimes build this um, Java platform. Um, Java has been developed, developed for about two years. The first bit is sometime in 22nd of July, so it's been going on for a while. And Lambda has been talking about for years and years before that. Um, and um, so it's a long time coming. Right, so what is this lambda that we've been talking about? So uh, it's basically a uh, closure of Java. So does anybody know what closure is? 
not uh, uh, Okay. Um, so what I'm said is actually quite a big change in the Java language. So the last time Java has a new syntax is that that's quite radical. It's Java 5 when we introduced generic types and things like that. And that's the last radical change. And, and then Java 6 and Java 7 is more uh, evolutionary, so adding new APIs and adding new bits and pieces to it. But this time for Java 8 is a major change in language. Um, the lambda is a huge part, it touches a lot of different areas of the language. Um, so this is why the, the lambda itself it takes so long to be discussed by the Java community in terms of agreeing something that sort of like, you know, it's, it's working for everybody as well as it's sort of like, you know, agreement. And um, there has been lots and lots of argument in terms of how to implement lambdas. Um, so it started in about 2005, 2006, and uh, James Gosling, who is the godfather of Java, has had no closure with Java in 2006. 2007, there's three proposals, and then 2008, Mark Reinhold, who is the project lead um, from Sun Oracle, uh, there's no closure with Java. And then in the end, um, after all this argument, fighting, and things like that, we finally get a proposal together that uh, everybody agrees with and um, that's what, when the uh, Lambda project starts. So it takes four years already, so it's since it's been proposed. Um, so it's been arguing long and hard and so far, you know, a lot of stuff like, you know, fighting and stuff like that. But luckily the Java community has come to agreement on how to implement it. Right, so uh, I'm going to briefly scan a scheme for what Lambda is and why is it needed in Java and how it's going to be, uh, how it's going to be helping uh, readability. Um, but, um, so uh, you might need some sort of the Java uh, language understanding for that. So most people understand. Okay. So I've got a piece of code for that. This is how you will implement. Um, so let's say you've got a, a button on a GUI and a swing GUI. Um, and you want to, you want when you click on the button, you want it to do certain things. This is how you would actually write this in so the like current version of Java. So you add something called the action listener, uh, which is a active button, and then basically you have to build a sort of like you know, a so called anonymous class. Why is it called anonymous class? Because it's got no class name here. You can't reference it anywhere else except this bit. And what happens that you declare a method and say action listener click the button and do something after the click. So that's the type of um, style you to write today in uh, an anonymous class. Well, I noticed that, so far, you know, it's very clumsy. There's a lot of structure that's not needed. That you need, need one, so you have to declare what the type is, and you have to have the two method headers and things like that. It's very clumsy. You have to say a lot of things in order to just achieve one, uh, so far, you know, just, just achieve one method. And what happens if you want to pass, say, variables from the um, from, from your main class into this, this thing? Well, you can do that, but you have to declare all your variables final, and you'll be very careful about uh, sort of like, uh, how, you, how you pass that uh, characters. So it causes developers to write a lot sort of like, you know, variables code and things like that. So this is one of the reasons why people complain about Java is not being concise and things like that just because of this uh, enormous class. So can we actually do better than this? Well, we can. Um, and that's why they introduced Lambda expressions. Um, if you've done any Java programming uh, before, you'll, no you'll probably have noticed that, um, let's say you want to create a thread, and you want to ask it to execute certain things inside a thread. You create a, uh, you create a class that contains runnable. And that normally exists in one method. So runnables contains a public void run. Um, comparators, so for example, if you want to compare, uh, enable comparison between two different objects so that you can put it between, you implement a comparator. And if you look at comparator interfaces in, in Java, it only contains one method. And same as runnables, same as for the action listener. And so we, uh, we, uh, we introduce that expression so we can't get those type of uh, methods. Uh, hold, hold on, because I think they come back, come back to the lunch now, so I can just call it for a minute. Okay, so uh, 
sorry, yeah, people are just joining. I've started a bit for about 10 minutes already, so I thought we <laughs> managed to catch up. But anyway, so as I said, a lot of these interfaces, vulnerables, comparators, action listeners, they really contain, their interface contains only one method. And um, we, we identify those as something called single abstract methods. And in Java 8, we, uh, the Java compiler actually single out, automatically recognize those single abstract methods. And that basically allows you to actually write that in this type of syntax uh, so that um, you can, um, uh, you, you don't have to declare with an on class and literally just expand it um, between the Java C. So this is, this is what a lambda expression is. So it's basically you say the input parameters from the class of the lambda, we look back and we look back at that. So basically all this thing is takes in as an action list, an action event, and then you basically the action you perform and it's not returning anything. So that's exactly what the compiler matches. So you take the action this time, and then basically you perform something and then do something with the purpose. So that matches the signature and it will automatically expand the uh, interface to actually match the next state. So it's a very um, uncertain, I think most people would agree, this syntax is much more cleaner and much more understand uh, understandable compared to compared to, um, compared to this, which has got a lot of sort of like the class methods and things like that. Okay. Um, one of the main reasons that they want really want to really to implement the uh, lambdas in Java is, is actually to do with uh, how you access the collections. So Java API provided things like lists and maps and trees uh, and, and things like that. Um, and at the moment, the way that it's being implemented, uh, it looks like this. So if, you, if you're writing in current version of Java and basically you want to uh, you load your employees from database and then you want to work out who's got the highest pay. This is how you probably would implement it using the current sort of Java API. So you need to build a for loop, you have to then the right some kind of heading which you get join and what's the highest pay and then work it out. Now what's wrong with this? Well the problem with this is uh, so firstly you need to care about how you store that uh, 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 arrays how you get them. Uh, elements of the array. Um, we call this external iteration. The reason is that um, you have to need to know what the data structure is. Is it a map? Is it a, uh, a tree or things like that? And you have to do slightly different things. So, for example, if it's a, if it's an employee, uh, if it's a map, then I will need to get the keys and then get the uh, value out. So, you, when you write that code, you're not just focus on how finding all the elements, but you have to focus on how you actually iterate, how to actually get each element out of the state structure. Um, and so it's very clumsy and it doesn't allow us a lot of optimization. So uh, a lot of people design new APIs to do this. Um, so the place that I work actually uh, uh, open source our own collection API with a very fast called GS Collection, it's actually on GitHub, you can actually download it. And what happens is that um, this API, uh, this new Collections API allows you to do something called internal iteration. So what happens is that this is how you look, you use the GS Collection, if you use the list from GS Collection. Notice that in this piece of code, I don't need to say I go through every single element. What I'm basically saying is, it's like SQL, say, select from the elements, that's the conditions, and then and then I collect them into new elements, and then this is the condition, and then you call you work out the maximum out of the uh, new integer collection. Right? It looks more like SQL, you don't care about how the data structure maps your uh, how to read each element. Um, much more cleaner and you focus on, on on business logic. Just like you're writing SQL you focus on how you how you want to select data rather than focusing on sort of like you know, uh, to get each keys and get values and things like that. So this is an improvement, but still because we don't have lambdas, so 
you can, you can actually use this with Java 6, this API works with Java 6. But what happens then without the lambdas, you have to write all this anonymous class, which makes it very clumsy. It looks sort of like you know, very robust. So now, now that we have um, if we have uh, lambdas, let's see what it looks like. So now with lambdas, we can actually write something like this. So remember, I said um, the single abstract methods. So these are single all these classes are only from this one method, one method in the interfaces. So what happens is that we can actually train that. Remember I said you want to train it in lambdas, you look at the input parameters, you declare it, and then you, you just write the logic, right inside that. So that's what it's end up with. So this is input parameters that you pass in, the interface, and then the conditions. Now, I'm sure everybody agrees this syntax is much more clearer from this syntax, right? Because you, you, you don't need to sort of care about all this kind of fluff about grading classes, numbers classes, and things like that. It's much more readable. You can quite easily tell that it's it's like reading SQL, so I want to select the element according to the conditions, and I want to select all the pay into a new array, and now we can work out the maximum from that array, from that collection. Much more, much more readable. And so it allows programmers to focus on business logic rather than sort of on how you iterate all the elements. Um, so it's a much, much better way of programming. Um, and Another important thing to point out is that you don't have to change any of the existing libraries to support this. A lot of it, this existing libraries work with Java 6, and when you move to or Java 7, when you move to Java 8, you can instantly use the new syntax without changing a lot of the libraries. So this is one of the really good things about Lambda, the way that they actually implement this, is that sort of I know the um, the line doesn't change, but you can actually take one of it and cook things when you're ready to move to Java 8. And, if you, and, and your library can sort of like compile with Java 7, but then when you drop to Java 8, you can put the new source code in your in your, in your code. So, much better. Um, and a lot of this work is actually done in the, um, uh, in, in the Java C compiler side. So the VM actually doesn't actually change that much to support this. And um, when they're developing um, lambdas, they actually run it with Java 7. So you, they have actually backport, you can actually uh, have some of these backports to Java 7 uh, if you want to, really want to use lambdas in your, in your code base. But obviously, um, um, it's Java is forward compatible, and it's probably better for you to go straight to Java 8. Okay, so that's the introduction to lambdas. Um, and if you want to sort of find out more and sort of like you know, want to uh, look at a couple more examples, more advanced stuff, please come to our JEG meeting next Thursday and then we need to um, do some tutorials together and to, to, to look at the members. Yeah, we should do one more. Okay? Now, um, I'm going to quickly talk about some of the uh, improvements in class libraries. So uh, that's the APIs that we uh, use with the Java program. Um, so there's two, uh, I highlight two uh, enhancements that people would uh, be interested in. So the first one is the above table processing for collections. That's for the existing Java util maps and, and lists and tape trees and things like that. And basically that uh, add the extra uh, 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 internal iteration support, remember we talked about um, to do select and things like that in GS collection. They implement it and they put slightly different. They put filter, map, and black. But it does exactly the same thing as we did with the um, employees example. Um, another good thing that they're enabling is uh, the parallel iteration. So remember when we write this type of thing, um, your list, potentially, you can actually parallelize it inside the API. So if you've got multiple CPUs, because you're not iterating it, you're not going through the elements yourself, you're not telling um, Java how to go through every single element. And when you pass this, you can actually, if the API is clever enough, you can split the list into two halves, chuck it to two CPU, and then do a fork join kind of um, work that parallelize it. And 
what happened with JDP 107 is that it implemented parallel interfaces. So you don't have to worry about uh, how to do parallel iterations, it automatically focuses it for you. Um, so it's really good, especially nowadays you've got so many cores in our CPUs. Uh, it really helps you to utilize uh, uh, sort of, uh, the cores in, in, in your machines uh, to, to, uh, to its best ability without you worrying about it. Uh, another improvement in the class libraries is the um, date and time API, the JEP150 GSR310. Um, it's inspired by another time library called Jolder Time. Um, so at the moment, the, the existing Java date and time API is terrible. Um, so for example, January. Uh, January is zero, and then February is one. You have to click that and say that. And that's stupid. Uh, it's completely unusable. It's um, the date is uh, is mutable, so potentially you, it's not like a string that is creating copy, but it's mutable. So potentially, if you pass a string uh, date object to another um, API and then you change it, then it will actually affect somebody else. That's terrible, crazy. So they implement this new API, completely rewritten the whole thing. Um, so now it's. Uh, it's, it's mutable, so you can actually use it like string, you can pass it into another API and don't have to worry about side effects or modifying it. Um, much better usability, the format, how you format the date is uh, much improved and it deals with UTCs and things like that. So the date and time is actually stored as an offset um, in UTC and then it will automatically translate time zone to things like that for you. Much better. Um, and people have been asking for this for years and years. But again, because of that, during the days when the sort of sun is dying and all is flying up the sun, that, um, that, that, that management stuff um, cost all the progress. Mm -hmm. But now they finally managed to get it in, so in Java they've got a much better thing on API. Right, um, Nashorn. So, anybody heard of Nashorn? Right, um, so since Java 6, Java itself actually got a JavaScript interpreter built into Java. If you download Oracle Java 6 and Java 7, you actually have a JavaScript engine built into JVM itself. And you can actually, uh, so not many people know about it because the performance is terrible. Uh, nobody ever uses it. Um, however, uh, what happens is that in Java 7, they've implemented support for dynamic language with a new uh, biker and it's um, a lot of this dynamic language engine um, can be implemented much more easily and efficiently in Java 7. And so Oracle decided, right, we need to do a sample implementation of one language. And obviously, you already have JRuby, which is the, one of the best performing Ruby implementation um, from, from, the, uh, from the thing. So, no point in Ruby. So, they decided to re implement the JavaScript engine. Completely um, as an example on how to use the dynamic language support in JVM. Um, and so it's actually very lightweight, very fast. The benefits with running your JavaScript in, with, with JVM is that you can actually call your Java API through JavaScript. So you can have JMS and you can have Java Ethics with your JavaScript libraries, which you wasn't able to do before. Um, and then you can and obviously vice versa as well. So if you want to uh, provide some sort of scripting support in your Java applications, you can use it through this uh, national API. And um, existing JavaScript, a lot of existing JavaScript engine doesn't have native support for multi-threading, and obviously Java has multi-threading since pretty much day one. Um, so so far, you know, with, with new national engine, you can be able to a lot of JavaScript to use the Java library for parallelizations and mod threading, and then um, uh, can make use of that. Um, there is actually an implementation of Node.js on Nashorn, it's called Node.jar, um, and they, they actually aim to run as much of the Node.js uh, stuff um, mm -hmm. in, in, in the ADM. Um, I don't think at the moment it's uh, performing as fast as Node.js plus V8, but um, their target is to actually get as uh, work as close to the performance of V8 as possible. And certainly there's no technical limitation of why that's not the case. And obviously it's the project is still quite young, so it probably take a bit of time before they optimize everything to, to get to that level. But Hotspot is very capable VM. 
you would actually get to that uh, performance. Okay, um, so a couple more minutes. Um, I'm going to talk about some hot spot improvements. Um, so if you have done any J um, Java programming before, you've done hyper and then done Hibernate or content things like that, I'm sure you run into a situation where the JVM complains about old memory error at home gen. So what happens is that the JVM actually stores all the classes, metadata, so when you load the class uh, into JVM, you actually have to store extra pieces of information. And they used to have a memory error called home gen, and it's fixed size, so if you load anything more than that, um, and it's not dynamic size, it's sizable. Um, so what happens is that you potentially run out of those perfect aspects and a lot of programs get set before. Now, um, so Oracle actually decided, and in fact, actually just only CrossBot actually ever had perfect check. All the other JVM doesn't actually have this concept. And they basically just use a lot and things like that. So um, they has, uh, in Java 8, they have decided to remove the perfect gen. And basically, any sort of like, you know, bits that can go into normal Java heap will go there. And any classes data that just can't go in the Java heap, they just use native for long. So you don't, won't have another situation where you can get a lot of memory or time care. Um, another improvement is um, a new specific uh, um, compiler hint called Contented. And what happened is that we reduced both sharing for Java objects. Um, so that's get to a bit low level. So it's down to the way that the CPU captures um, how, you, how you put some sort of data together. If you have an object that's got two fields, so sort of two integer fields, um, sit next to each other, what happens is that potentially those fields sit in the same cache line, which is the unit of cache data that they store in the CPU. And if you have got two threads trying to access those two fields, even those two fields are independently accessed, the CPU will still have to lock the CPU bus. So you, in terms, literally con um, make your um, thread serialized because you can't, because basically they have to throw away all the cache data and then basically um, have a really poor performance. Now with the JEP142, you can actually tell the CPUs that say that, all right, you put that contender in front of your uh, fields and basically you tell this hotspot that, well, those two fields are potentially contender, so you can put extra padding in that. And then what happens is that it improves a lot of the uh, multi thread performance um, for these Java objects. So that's a uh, really good thing that they have implemented. And probably if you are writing normal Java application, you probably wouldn't care too much about that, but if you're writing uh, libraries, you writing the collections, then you would. Um, finally, there's a lot of bug fixes. G1GC, which is the new garbage collector for large heap and concurrent, um, concurrent um, type uh, garbage collection, is now much more stable and performant. They fix a lot of bugs. Um, so if you ha are having a problem with CMS and so of like parallel collector before, you definitely want to try G1 um, in in uh, Java 8. Um, Jim compiler itself is updated to support the latest CPU, it uses AV8, uh, it can use the AES um, encryption support in the latest generation of Intel CPU to um, do encryptions and improve the performance. Right, so um, I have gone through um, all the sort of the big items in Java 8, there's obviously more. Um, so please come to our talk on uh, Thursday to uh, sort of learn a bit more about that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the OpenJDK project and sort of like how it can help uh, in terms of uh, Java 8. Okay. Um, so for people who don't know, um, Oracle open source the um, well, or Sun, still Sun. Um, they open source the Java uh, implementation in uh, GPL. Uh, with classified exception that allows you to um, that allows you to sort of like you know uh, uh, look at what hotspots doing and sort of like mm -hmm. you know, extra features and things like that. Uh, there are a couple of parts that they haven't open sourced it, but um, probably wouldn't be care too much about it. So web start and plugin they haven't open sourced it, but I would recommend anybody writing any more Java plugin web start because it's a security 
security vulnerabilities is just crazy. And by the way, all the security vulnerabilities here about Java has nothing to do with the server side, it's all to do with web start and plugging. And I would love for them, I'd love to uh, for Oracle to actually get rid of that plugging and web start as soon as possible, but they're not. So I'm afraid Java will be stuck with those for a bit. Um, so, uh, because of those missing parts, um, the plugging and web start, what happens is that Red Hat has actually implemented a project uh, called IC, which is basically adding the bits that's missing from the OpenJDK um, with other open source components. And um, they, those developers are actually come from the uh, ClassPath uh, path project. And um, most of your distribution like Ubuntu, Fedora, have uh, SUSE actually based their uh, open source Java implementation uh, on, on the IoT project. And obviously, Java 7 has also been open source, and Java 6 as well. You can actually get to the source code on the OpenJDK project homepage, and if you want to compile your own, things like that, and hack on JVMs, you can download the source code. So I hope uh, so I know what top down interests you in terms of sort of like getting involved with Java again. And if you are interested, there are a couple of initiatives that sort of like you, um, you can get involved with. Um, so uh, a big group of Java user group around the world has actually come together and started something called a Attack Open JDK project. So remember in the beginning of the talk, I talked about six million lines of code. There's a lot of um, things to work on. Um, so what happens is that a bunch of us in, in, in Java user group gets together and then basically um, trying to uh, improve the build experience of the OpenJDK source code, um, organize test classes, tutorials and writing documentations. Um, and if you are sort of Java developers and uh, you don't have to have really you don't need to be like me who used to be a Java developer, uh, Java JVM uh, developer, but a lot of parts of JVM is basically written in Java, so if you are competent Java developers, you can actually definitely help out with some of these and tests and documentation. So like, you know, it doesn't really need a lot of programming skills, so you can definitely uh, help us. Um, Adopt the JSR. JSR is stand for Java Service Request, Specification Request. It's basically how Java evolved. So any new API, so for example, if you look at the um, JSPs, standards and things like that, they all have their own JSR. And what happens is that um, there's a lot of people proposing different types of JSR and if you're interested in to getting those JSR into production into the Java platform, um, you, you can actually arrange to join the, um, the community and to actually look up those specifications. Okay? And Hong Kong Java User Group is always uh, looking for any volunteers if you want to participate. So if you're interested in Okay, here's the link. Um, I'll, I'll put the, um, I'm sure they have a website to put the slides and I'll put the slides up there. And that's it. So, any questions? Okay, so, um, oh, yeah. Android. <laughs> <laughs> How feasible is it to have all those J uh, Java Net features ported or somehow deployed to Android? Um, the problem with Android is yeah. that um, uh, the data is very different from the way uh, from the way the hotspot and the pipe works. Um, there has there are projects to port the OpenJDK run on the Android platform as a native application. Um, but that has not very very far. Um, so I'm afraid if you want, if you like Java 8 features, you I'm afraid you go top of Google and get it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I don't think it's that hard because a lot of this um, these um, sort of like you know, lambdas and things like that they are done in the Java C level. So uh, the bytecode level doesn't actually change that much. Um, the only problem I think with Dalvik is that uh, it doesn't really support uh, the dynamic loading of classes as well as all the other stuff. So you might have a bit of problem in terms of sort of trying to do both dynamics. So 
some of these um, JavaScript engines and things like that, and even Lambda is actually used to feature sort of like dynamically matching some of these um, methods. That might not go terribly well with how downloading sort of being put together. Um, so, um, so this is why you hear a lot of people running game on, on Android. It's because of the way that they implement it. Um, yeah, I don't know what group, how Google is going to take sort of like, you know, downloading and the drama effect that one. I've got no idea. So, I'm getting on that side, but um, I suspect it's probably not hugely difficult. There's a lot of work, but it's not hugely difficult. Thank you. Okay. Any? Okay. Thank you very much.